I'm Selwyn Jones, the uncle of the late George Floyd. In my nephew's case, in his death, he didn't have a choice. But with COVID-19, we do. Hi, I'm Shelley Clark White of The Honeycomb and co-host of the sensational podcast, That's My Story. While we all understand the discomfort of wearing a mask and receiving a vaccine, please recognize at this present time, the only solution to fighting this deadly virus is being vaccinated and wearing a mask because we cannot afford to do nothing. Hello, my name is Laura Lai McBroom. I'm a professional singer. I've worked with Pink Floyd, the Rolling Stones, Nile Rogers, and presently with the McBroom sisters. The facts are 99.5% of all COVID deaths are among those who are unvaccinated and who refuse to wear a mask. Hi, and I'm Ken Knox of the group chairman of the board and co-host of the awesome podcast, That's My Story. So why play Russian roulette with your life and those of your family? COVID is real and it is on the rise. It is not going away unless we as a society together save society. And I'm Stephen Davis, the host of the show about stuff, the Stephen Davis show. That means that at this time in history, getting vaccinated and wearing a mask for all of society is all important. The life you may save not only will be your family's and yours, but more importantly to me, my family and mine. Do us a favor, get vaccinated, wear your mask, please. Hello, get your official products such as this marvelous t-shirt that I'm wearing or this great coffee mug that I'm drinking out of and many other products with the show about stuff, the Stephen Davis logo at https colon slash slash www.zazzle.com slash store slash a stuff store and make sure you get your 15% discount a day. Welcome to a new podcast show about stuff. It's the show about stuff, the Stephen Davis show. Here's you host, Stephen Davis. Hello to all. Welcome to season two of the show about stuff, the Stephen Davis show. On this episode, I have a special guest from across the pond, Andrew Mandin Ramroop, OBE, live from London, England. Mr. Ramroop owns the legendary bespoke tailors Maurice Sidwell and is the first tailor to be made a visiting professor of the London Institute. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you for coming to my show today from all the way from London. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. I appreciate it. The first thing I think that my, my folks want to know is what is it, MBE? MBE is a member of the British Empire. I'm not a member of the British Empire. I am an officer of the most excellent order of the British Empire. So the OBE is an officer. The MBE is a member okay. uh, of, of the well, member of the British Empire, uh, but my mine is a little different, slightly higher. Slightly higher. Oh, what what benefits are there besides? Everybody knowing that you're a great person. I think that the actual benefit is that if you, if the queen comes forward to you and shakes your hand and pins a medal on your lapel, it's very special. Very few of us in our lifetime get that opportunity to even get close to the queen, but to have her face-to-face -face communicating with you, asking you about your skills, your career, what you've done, and you using that opportunity to communicate to her Majesty, about what you've been doing. The award is usually given to, to people who's achieved the highest level in different fields of endeavor. Many of, of the great sports stars have received awards from Her Majesty. Those who are captains of industry, politics, and those who've really achieved 
all sorts of, in, in, in charity as well. Those who's been very benevolent in the charitable, charitable work, they've all received awards. Not all have received awards. You've got to be, they, they, they were all made officers of the Order of the British Empire because of their contribution to music. So it's mm. in any field of endeavor where exceptional to be able to, you don't just get an award. You've got to be nominated and you've got to be nominated body. Up until today, I don't know who actually nominated me. All I know really? is that I got a letter from the Prime Minister's office asking for my permission to put my name forward for an award. Oh, very good. But I do know that you're in the company of the Beatles because they had an OBE also. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is it. You've uh, excelled, not just being another person working in that environment, but uh, that you've been exceptional. I think yeah, I'm very happy. I'm the only practicing tailor in history to receive the, an, an award such as this, and I'm very proud of it. Okay. Now, tell folks where you were born and tell them about your parents a little bit. My, my father was a charcoal miner, the sort of stuff you buy to, to do barbecues today. He was a charcoal miner. His family was charcoal mining. So where you dug the pit and you put the green timber in and you set it to fire and then cover it with, with different types of leaves and bamboo and, and other green stuff. So you put the logs underneath, cover it with green stuff so it would smoke rather than burn to ashes. And then they will cut that up and bag it and go in their donkey cart and sell it uh, through our Trinidad because of course we had very little electricity and so fuel to cook was charcoal or raw wood that you would go in the forest and you get and that's what my father did. And then later on, he got a job as a, a gardener, stroke messenger, stroke barman at the guest house and cleaner, master of all trades. And what when was the his owner, name? His name was John. John. My dad okay. was John. He was a bit of an entrepreneur. He was um, always trying to do something to make money. And so he opened a little, he got a cart. And he used to sell fruits and sweets and cigarettes and little bits and pieces to supplement his income to, to get us all fed. And my mother was, she was a maid. When she was working, she was a maid, but not a maid for money. She was a maid for in exchange for food. I, I do want my audience to know that one of the things that I discovered not too long ago was mm -hmm. that my great-grandfather came from Trinidad. Really? <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. Yes. And I, I had no idea that there was a connection there until I, I found it and it was there in black and white. And I, I even know the ship that he came over on in 1813 from Trinidad. He was very interesting. 15 years old. That's very, very interesting that you've yes. got that record. Living in Trinidad at that time as a young uh, as a youngster, how was it? How I came from the foothills of northern range of mountains. My father had dug down the side of the mountain to create a bit of a flat space so he can build a wooden house. It was a one room house. I would say a two two room house, but not a two bedroom house. A one bedroom house. At that time, it was four of us siblings, and I. It was squatting land. No one bothered you being up up in the hills there. And they had an outside outside toilet and an outside kitchen. And uh, there was a, at the side of the precipice was a stream and, and a cocoa estate. And the other side of the, uh, because we were actually at the top of the hills, the other side was a, a free flowing river. And there was a cocoa estate there. And I grew up learning. I actually learned to swim in that river, climbing trees, climbing coconut trees picking fruits, jumping from branch to branch, biting a fruit. There were all these different types of fruits in season. And that was, it was, for me, it was idyllic, the, the flora, the fauna, the excitement of growing up in an environment that was very country-like. And uh, to come from that kind of environment without clothes, without having the need to wear clothes, never mind having not having clothes. <laughs> but uh, it was a pretty, pretty basic environment, but a very happy one, I have to say, because we knew nothing else. We knew nothing else. Parents didn't have to bother about where we were. We would go missing for many hours being in the woods or being in the river or somewhere playing and having fun. What were you scared of? Snakes and stuff that were in the, in the wild? There were lots of animals in the wild. There was something called, it's like a leopard. It's 
called an ocelot. And there were tears and there were snakes, certainly plenty of snakes. But, you know, we never thought about being scared. When I was very young, a child, I fell down the precipice and I fell. I, I still carried a scar that started from my elbow all the way up to my wrist. I just went like that, skating down the, on, on, on my tummy and my down the hill. And I carried a scar of that today. So it was a pretty, pretty precarious environment to grow up in as well. But we, we were happy. We knew nothing else. Our food was very basic. We had a, a what, was, what is known here as a kitchen garden, but it wasn't a kitchen garden. It was like at the side of the hill. My father had cleared away an area, planting different types of vegetables for my mother to cook. Having meat was a rarity. Once a month on a Sunday, we will have meat, but it'll be like spinach, and it'll be different types of vine, vine vegetables that we'll eat. Now, actually, just starting out, what you're saying just fits right into the theme of my show, which is progress despite obstacles. So you are yeah. a wonderful first guest on my second season <laughs> to, oh, il well, to illustrate that. <laughs> I'm happy to be first, yes. <laughs> now, now tell me, how was it in school? Uh, did you? That's an interesting question. When you come from the hills, the teachers at school never really take you seriously because you'll never mount to anything. So they, it seems. Mm -hmm. And quite a lot of my colleagues didn't amount to, to very much, but those who did, they did very well. For me, they send you through school and, and you learn the basic, reading, writing, ar arithmetic. You didn't learn anything else. There was nothing about geographies. There was nothing very advanced. It was very basic. And so you go through that system, and when you are age 11, you do something called an 11 plus exam. And if you pass your 11 plus exam, then you go into college and you learn to you, you, you do your O levels, ordinary levels, which are five different subjects. And you pay there to teach you. Whereas in my school, they didn't actually teach you. You just turned up and you occupied a space. I don't ever recall being coerced into learning anything. They would beat the hell out of you. It was a time when they, it was caning. And if you didn't know something, instead of directing you, I remember clearly trying to pronounce a word that was broken. In fact, it was L-E-T dash. And then the next line was U-C-E. And I couldn't put the L-E-T-T-U-C-E -E together. I couldn't put the letters together. And I couldn't pronounce it. And you, you basically got beaten for that. You should know it. And this was a lesson that it was meant to be teaching. So I, it, it, it's not surprising that I didn't enjoy school because there were these challenges, these many challenges. And one time I belonged to, we had five groups in school and one of the groups, well, every day, each group will have to clean the classroom and sweep and clean the school basically. And I had forgotten it was my turn. And I was going home and I could, I heard, or, my name being called and when I turned around it was a teacher calling me because I was heading home and I should have been sweeping the classroom. Now when I got back he beat the hell out of me and I'd never forget it. I'd never ever forget it and, and after that I still had to clean classroom. It's not a day. Now that I got a caning and I got away with it. Anyway I still remember that teacher Patrick today. I always throughout my life I carried a grudge. I said when I grow up I'm going to beat the hell out of him. He's, he emigrated fortunately. Uh... <laughs> he got away. You got so, but so, I, so, so you, you, where you went to school, college was not the same thing as the United States. No, college was, if you pass your 11 plus exam, but I try hard to fail my exam because I didn't want to go to college. I wanted to be a tailor. I learned, I knew from a very young age what I wanted to do for my career. I was about nine years old when I cut up my mother's pillowcase into the shape of a <laughs> pajama pants. And I, I don't remember what the punishment was, <laughs> but I remember using our machine. We had those hand sewing machine that you wheel it with one hand and you control with the left hand. And I sewed on the outside leg and I sewed on the inside leg and I washed it and hung it up in line to dry. I was so proud of it. My mother reminded many, me many years later that I was about nine years old when I did that. I don't remember how many pillowcases I cut up, but I... I it may have been just one because I'm sure I got a spanking for it at the time. But I was so I was so overwhelmed with the happiness of what I made, I didn't feel the blows. At that time, you got a spanking for almost anything. You just look up at your parents in the eye, you get a spanking. Uh, and my father never spared the rod. But you know, the the experience at school, I was 
very deliberate in trying to fail my exam so I wouldn't go to college. And so I was successful in failing. <laughs> and what I didn't um, bargain for was that my godfather, he was a teacher at one of the leading colleges and he could still get me into college even though I had failed my exam. And so I grumbled a lot, but I couldn't grumble to my parents. And there was this girl next door, uh, her name was Janet. And I used to, and I fancied Janet, I liked her. I was only 11, 12 years old, hey man, I'm a boy. True love. Man. <laughs> and I grumbled to Janet that if they send me to school, I'd play truant. And she actually told her mother and her mother then told my mother. And so you could see that the journey now, my mother would now telling my father. And so a, a spanking is underway. But I wasn't aware that Janet had told her mother. Mm -hmm. So when my mother called me and asked me, what was this going on? I, I said, I didn't want to go. I really didn't want to go to, to college. And I, I could almost feel this here today, sitting there and she passing her fingers through my curly hair as though she was moving out the knots from it and saying, you've got to continue going to school for at least another year, but I'll speak to your father. And that was an important turning point because for whatever reason, they allowed me to continue for another year because you couldn't leave school at, at 12. You had to go on to year 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. And so before my 14th birthday, I finished schooling and I went off to learn the trade. I first went off to learn to make pants and shirt. Now, and was this in Trinidad that you did in, this? Absolutely, up in the hills, right up in the hills. Uh, in fact, go ahead, the, tailor, the tailor was further up the hill and he was just on the, the, the other side of the hill, but a bit higher up. So he was a mountain tailor as well. And, mm -hmm. and they were living in squatting land as well. Okay, so now you leave college and you do you apprentice? Is it an apprenticeship that you do? Or is it a schooling for tailoring that you go to? No, there's, uh, I was too young to go to the school for tailoring. They didn't accept me. They never explained why. They just said, yeah, we can't take him. I, so I learned with this other tailor. I learned to make pants. And uh, after that, I asked to be paid and he wouldn't pay me. My parents paid $20, the equivalent of, uh, of about 10 pounds a month. 10, not, not 10 pounds, 10 US dollars a month. They paid him quite a lot of money because my father wasn't earning very much with all these odd jobs. Mm -hmm. He was he was earning the equivalent of, I think it was like fifteen dollars a month or something U.S. Mm -hmm. and and paying about two dollars a month for me to learn the trade. Mm -hmm. And I learned to make pants in no time at all. In six weeks, I'd learned to make pants. So my parents only paid for two months. So he only paid $4 for me to learn, which was a great help because that $2 was a huge strain. Mm -hmm. However, I learned to make pants and I started working for this tailor and he wasn't paying me. And I wanted to, I asked him to learn to make jackets and he wouldn't teach me. He says, you're not ready yet because I'm working for him for free. So he didn't want to teach me to make jackets. And so another tailor down in the town offered me to learn to make jackets. And then I went on there. And after the first day, this pants maker that I started with went up and he cussed up that other guy for taking me away. And so I only lasted one day. I got fired the following morning. I went the following morning. I went back to learn to make jackets. And he said, you can't come back here. This is what happened last evening. Here I am, age 14. I got fired from a job. So we had no choice but to go back to this other guy and ask him for my job back. And then he said, no. He said, no. And not only did he say, no, he said, I'll, I'll see to it that you don't get anywhere in the street. And so for months, I was at home. I was mainly at, in the woods, at the river, playing, having fun out there, and just wasting away. Not knowing my parents were very worried about me. My father, he got me apprenticeship in Port of Spain, the capital, a long way away, a long way away. It was only 10 miles away, but when you're living in the country, when you're living in the country in a small island, it feels 10 miles away is, ooh, boy, what a, what a journey. Take a train and you go 
a, a steam train to go there in, in the town. Man, that was that was a big thing. You know, funny, I'm laughing because I live across the street from some stores and stuff around. So if a store is up two blocks away, I ain't going. <laughs> it's too far. It's one of the tricks about getting me an apprenticeship in Port of Spain was that this tailor couldn't find me. He couldn't stop my, my career. And the fortunate thing is that tailor who turned me down, he did me a big favor. He did me a big favor because this gentleman that I got an apprenticeship with to learn to make jackets in Port of Spain, he had been to England in the 60s and he had gone back to Trinidad to do his business, to develop his business. So he came to train and went back to start his own business. And so he excited my mind about this distance land called Savile Row that he knew I would never get there. But little did he know my mind was excited um, about this place that I hadn't done geography at school. So I didn't know anything about England or Europe, but he's telling me about Savile Row, like the captains of industry, prime ministers, Hollywood stars, presidents. That's where they went to have their suits made. They went to the best. So like a young athlete wanting to be Olympics, I wanted to be in the Olympics of tailoring. I learned my trade really well. I learned to make jackets like a young child learning to play a musical instrument. I learned very quickly and because I was 14 years old and 14, 15, 16, 17, I saved every cent I earned, every cent I earned. I saved and saved and saved because I wanted to go to Savile Row. When I was 17 and a half years old in July, 1970, I got a passport on the 13th of July and on the 29th of July, I bought a boat ticket and I sailed away straight away. And you didn't have, did you have relatives in London? Nobody. Nobody. You were just going Nobody. and you were going to get off the boat and. I didn't uh, know where I was going. Okay. I didn't wow. know where I was going. We had no TV. We had no nothing. We had, I think we had a, what was called a radio fusion. One of those things, one of those wooden boxes on the wall, but I didn't, I was going to Savile Row. So I landed in Southampton. I had made myself two suits and I was wearing one of them. I have one of them in my, my what is called an excuse for a suitcase is a carry-on, but a much smaller carry-on than you would have on a plane now. Um, I had two pairs of pajamas. My father gifted me two pajamas, two sets of pajamas. And I had made myself the two suits and I had one shirt, two shirts I had short sleeve shirt and a long sleeve shirt and I had one pair of shoes and one or two pants set. No, no, I had one pants, a black stripy pants and that's what I came with. That's all I came with. I bought my own ticket and I came and I got to Southampton where the boat docked uh, wearing my suit. So I was looking pretty serious. So when the immigration officer, but the immigration actually goes on, go on the boat. You don't disembark. They go on the boat to stamp your passport there. They said, where are you staying? Now, I had rehearsed an address that I've never been to. I've never <laughs> been to. <laughs> so when he, said, when he asked me where I was staying, I rolled out. I could tell you that now, 51 years later, I could tell you it was 371 Camden Road, N4 was the zip code. At that time, only one zip code was N4. Now the zip code is a lot longer. But yeah, it was 371 Camden Road. I've never been there. Um, <laughs> and bang, stamped my passport, six months visitor's visa. Because I was said I was coming on a holiday. I was visiting family. You didn't have to have a letter or anything. And because I came by boat, it wasn't strict. Even by plane, it wasn't strict. But I couldn't afford the plane ticket. Anyway, I, I came. I got digs in North London up in the attic. And I lived in that attic and the landing, like the corridor, I don't know if you know, it's mm -hmm. called a landing. Mm -hmm. The landing was a sink and it was a, it was a cooker. So it was a sloping, the attic was very sloping, but the window was under, you would get light, but it, it but that, that was about it. And oh, I had, a, I think I had a, yeah, I did have a little bit. And I went to Savile Row, I arrived on a Saturday and the Monday, um, wearing my suit, I went, came to Savile Row looking for a job. And I got a job at a, a company called Sinclair, Anthony Sinclair. Now they had a sign out in the window advertising 
And that's how they did things. So you had a sign on the window saying, presser wanted, tailor wanted, trouser maker wanted, jacket maker long. Basically that was saying, or, or hand, H-A-N-D, hand wanted. So I went into this hand wanted sign and, and I, it says, yeah, you can start on Monday. So the following Monday, which was the 17th of August, 1970, I turned up to work. And it's a tale of woe, but it's a great story because I always believed throughout my life, all the challenges I've had have been opportunities. It was almost like a signpost directing me someplace else. So when I went in this Monday for the job, another guy had seen, he saw the sign and he came in as well. But that was a white guy. So I had already been given a table where I'm going to start work. But then the boss interviewed, and this guy was Anthony Sinclair. He used to make Sean Connery's suit. He used to make all the suits for the James Bond. Oh, okay. So he was a big tailor, big, well-known tailor, busy man. And so when I went to, to start work, he came up to me about 20 minutes later. He hadn't given me anything yet to do. And he said to me, have you used an iron like this? And I said, no, I haven't. But it's one when you plug it in, the damn thing gets hot. But I didn't use that brand of iron. Uh, I'm used to using an iron in Trinidad. He said, well, if you haven't used an iron like this, you can't work here. So I got fired. About Before you 20... started? Yeah, I got 20 minutes after a job I hadn't started yet, I got fired. But it was clear. And he, he gave this other guy named Richard. He gave Richard the job because Richard fit the profile. And he needed help. I applied, got it. Someone else applied. He fitted the profile. I got fired. But he was clearly, he must have seen my disappointment. He said, I'll call around and try and get you another job. He called another tailor on Saville Row. Now, Anthony Sinclair wasn't actually on the street of Saville Row, completely opposite Saville Row on, on another street called Conduit Street. And I went to this other tailor. This tailor asked me if I had a sewing machine at home. I can work for him as an art worker. I only just arrived in the country. I didn't tell him that, though. I said, no, I haven't got a machine. He says, well, okay, I'll ask someone else, see if they can give you a job. So he called up Huntsman and Son, the most famous tailors in the world, where Gregory Peck went, where, you know, all the big Hollywood guys went there, where the John F. Kennedy went, came to Savile Row. A lot of the big names throughout the world came to Savile Row, and they went to Huntsman's. And I went to Huntsman's, and they gave me a job. So I got fired at about 20 past nine, about half past 10. I had another job. That was amazing. That was great. Because these guys who turned me down, they were actually, I always believe, I was being called in another direction. But when I was at Huntsman's, after the first day at Huntsman, the following day I went into work. But I went through Saville Row. I went through the front of a shop where I went with the interview. Because I started the job straight away. And then they said, you can't come in here. You've got to go around the back entrance. And they wouldn't even let me in that day. I had to go back out, walk down Savile Row, walk across Burlington Street, walk up Regent Street, turn left into Conduit, into Hedden Street, and then enter the shop at the back. I had to make a full circle around four streets to enter the back. They wouldn't let me in at the front. And But all those things I tell you, Stephen, they were lessons. They were lessons in the early days. Coming from Trinidad, I didn't recognize racism. It was totally foreign to me. It didn't exist in my what limited vocabulary. I didn't know what it was. So coming here and having to experience those things, I thought, okay, yeah, you know, I took it easy. I was naive. In fact, being naive is what got me through where I am today. Because if I understood racism, I think I would have gone back home. Having said that, I've always wanted to go back home. Being in England was being on an extended holiday. It's albeit it's 51 years now, but I, I, I got six months of my passport. But I wiggled my way. I got really streetwise. I wiggled my way to the border agency. I got an extension of a month. I got another extension for a month. I keep getting extensions saying I'm going to school. I wasn't going to school. I was working. I was working two, three jobs. Um, not going to school, but I, but I was paying the fees at the school, but not attending. Mm -hmm. But if you're paying the fees, you get, a, you get a receipt and you take the receipt to the, what is called the UK Border Agency. You go to the UKBA and with the receipt from the school, they stamp your passport. 
And because I could only pay for three months at a time. So they'll give me an extension. And that's what I kept doing and doing all along until 1974, when the opposition wanted to win the election and they promised all illegal immigrants uh, amnesty so they can get to, to stay. And that's how I got to stay in England. Oh, really? Yeah. To that, that amnesty. One of the things that, that I do find, and, and you are a great example of that, is that if you don't do, nothing won't happen. You don't yep. know how it's going to turn out. It's not going to turn out at all if you don't do. <laughs> That's right. And, and you did. Yeah. And you, you had different experiences, but you are here today. <laughs> Absolutely. When I got that job at Huntsman's, and I was back of the shop, and I was working on all these fine cloth and these well-known names. I came because I came to London. I came to Savile Row because I'd heard about all these great people. and I couldn't see them I'm working on their clothes, but I couldn't see them. So being saving being in my DNA, I would save my money to have a job at Huntsman. I started work at 8 a.m. and I finished at 6. And in Trinidad, I was starting work at 20 past 7 in the morning and I was finishing at 9 at night. I was working six days a week. So all of these hours I had to work so I could save the money to go to England. And when I got here, working from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., it was like being on a permanent and Saturdays off, my friend, and Sundays off. And you were in London, in the heart heart of of Europe. (laughs) The action, where the action was. This is 1970, tail end of the 60s, when pot smoking pot and uh, the Beatles and uh, the the flower what's it called yeah the east coast the west coast of the united states the music the man flared trousers velvet suits it was an action place so i got a saturday job and then i got another job making the trousers for another tailor so i had three jobs going and again i was saving and then i left huntsman and i went to college full-time tailoring college a university of the arts London College of Fashion to do a three-year degree in bespoke tailoring, business studies, art and design, patent cutting, fitting, and PE, <laughs> physical education. And I learned, I, I, after the first year, the principal called me into his office and he said, if I put you, there's 15 students who starts in the first year and then 10 get selected to go on to the second year. And after the second year, eight gets selected to go to the final year. So this is a big thing. He called me into his office and he said, if you are able to complete a three-year degree in two years, I want to skip you from the first year to go on to the third year. Oh, wow. That was 900 pounds a year school fees I saved, my friend. I was paying foreign student fees of 900 pounds a year. I was working to pay fees. But the great thing is that I was a tailor and as I was a tailor and this time all this time now I'm still here illegally you know. but now I joined a full-time educational and in 1972 I joined the London College of Fashion to do a three-year degree so that I could get my visa but being in a tailoring school I got a table I got a machine I got a pressing equipment. I got everything I needed to work. Mm. So I was working. I was making suits for people. I was making suits for other students. I was making and making. I was using the classroom as my my work studio. So I was working my feet. Tell me this. What does, how did the name Bespoke came from? Where did that come from? The, The history of the word bespoke is when you go into a tailor, you didn't go with your own cloth. You go in there and the tailor had rows and rows of bolts of cloth. You'd go in there and you'd select your cloth. You'll have your name written on the swinging ticket and that cloth would be spoken for. So your cloth would be spoken for. That's the origin of the word bespoke. Now you can have a a financial package tailor-made and bespoke, especially for you. You can have a bespoke holiday. You can have a bespoke anything you want. So the word has, uh, the origins of the word bespoke 
came from tailoring. There's a bit of, yeah. Now, now what, what is it about from your childhood to where we at right now? What was it about tailoring that was so special to you? Was it the ability to advance or you just like the whole concept of creation of garments? That's a very good question because you mentioned the word creation. Is the creativity of taking it, what essentially is a flat piece of cloth and creating a three-dimensional form with it is sculpting cloth around a figure. Is being a sculpture with cloth, you've got different types of sculpture. You've got art and design. You've got a, a beautiful oil painting that you frame and put on the wall. You've got sculpture that's in the corner of someone's room or in a museum or in a public park. This is a piece of sculpture that is around a human body that's being portrayed. It's handmade that's being portrayed out, out into the world. And that is how I see sartorial art. That's how I see bespoke tailoring. And I've always had this love because of, we didn't have, first of all, we didn't have clothes. So I wanted initially to learn to make pants so that I could have clothes. And so I got that opportunity and I ran with it. When I got this opportunity at London College of Fashion to finish a three-year degree in two years, as a bespoke tailor, I came to Savalo looking for a job came back to Savaro looking for a job. So bespoke, the origin of the word bespoke, we, Maurice Sedwell was the only tailor on Savaro that had a sign that's saying bespoke tailor. No one- Tell me about, first, before I move to asking you that question, because you haven't, you, although you just mentioned it, you haven't gotten to the part about where you started working there. After you got out of school, when did you know you made it? I am still on a journey. I haven't made it yet. Oh, come on now. Come I'm, on now. Man, I'm, so I'm, many people I'm, that said that you have. Everyone else says that. I have a vision for myself. I have a vision for my family. And I believe that I'm always on a journey of discovery, a discovery a journey of learning. And I repeat those words because I continually set myself achievable goals and then I, when I achieve that, I set myself another high achievable goal. And then I keep going, just keep climbing the ladder. And it's almost like being in a cocoon, but everyone else is seeing you from the outside, but you're not seeing them. And my life is such that whatever I've achieved, infinitely more than I set out to achieve in my field with all of the accolades and, and awards and prizes, and lifestyle and so on. However, I am still on a journey. It is rather, when I arrive, I'm still going, you know. But, but, but you know, the, 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 what I meant by that question is that at some point, when we're young men and we are striving to, to go on a path, you look back and you say to yourself at that particular time, damn, I'm, I'm pretty good. Ah, people will start to notice me. <laughs> So okay. that at some point there that people began to notice you. You asked me a question. Let me tell you a story. When I came back to Sabro looking for a job, no one would give me a job. Mm -hmm. I came out of London College of Fashion in 1974. I'm now 22 years old. I have a lot of experience. I started when I was, before I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. I've got seven years of experience. I'm trained. I, they made a special certificate for me at, at college, a distinction in the field of tailoring. They made a certificate especially for me. And I came with my fancy certificate with a suit that I made looking for a job, but I didn't want to be in the back room. I wanted to be at the front. I wanted to be at the front. I wanted to, to be close to those who I've heard about. And no one, I was highly qualified, knowledgeable, recommended, no one. I just did not fit the profile of being the front of a shop on Cyber Row. They'll have African leaders come into Cyber Row at the front of a shop. They'll take their money, but they wouldn't employ their people at the front. They'll have customers from all over the world. They'll take their money. They ain't going to employ them. They're gonna, not going to employ you. I just didn't look right. And I had this West Indian accent. Nothing fitted the profile of what they wanted. In fact, one tailor, they're still on Savile Row, called Deej, Deej and Skinner. 
the boss, John Deed, said to me, he said, our customers would not take kindly to a foreigner. But if you want a job in the back room, you got a job there. I walked out. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be at the front of the shop. So I would keep back. Every time I go back to the college, the boss, would, the, the, the principal, I would tell him, I said, I didn't get a job. Didn't get a job. Didn't get a job. Didn't get a job. I said that it must have been 11 times. And lesser experienced persons were getting jobs. I wasn't getting it. Then Morris said, Mr. Morris said, well, call up the college. Bear in mind, you have eight graduates coming out of London College of Fashion. There must have been 45, 50 tailoring houses in and around Saburo. The business is booming. And eight graduates coming out. The world's your oyster. They're clamoring to employ you. But they ain't going to take me. I just didn't. And another guy called Braxton Phillips. They wouldn't take Braxton either. He was from Bermuda. Braxton and I graduated at the same time. They wouldn't take Braxton. They wouldn't take me. Braxton went back home. And Morris said, well, called up and says, do you have any graduates? Man, I was the only one unemployed. Braxton decided to go back home. And Morris said, well, give me a four-week trial. And so I worked my way up between with Morris said, and I wasn't at the front. He gave me a, a trial. After a couple of weeks, he said, you got the job. But I wasn't at the front, and I wanted to be at the front. But the front didn't make that much of a difference because he wasn't a ground floor tailor. He was an upper floor tailor. Every other tailor was on the ground floor. Maurice said, well, was the only tailor on the upper floor. And so being at the front didn't make a difference. When customers come, they either see you or they don't see you. But it was such a small shop with 500 square feet of space. They didn't see you because there is, you're there. But being at the back at Maurice said, whenever they had a problem, he would bring it to me to fix. And the customers began to recognize that I'm the guy who's doing the fixing of whatever it is was wrong. And so whenever they had a problem, customers began to ask for me. They began to ask for me. And then someone else offered me a job to pay me double my salary. And but Maurice said, well, I was working now five and a half days a week. I was doing all sorts of things. I wasn't just working at Maurice said, well, I'm making clothes for other people anyway. And he doubled my salary, he matched it. He wouldn't let me leave. So that's the first time I tried to leave. Then the second time I tried to leave, the principal at London College of Fashion came to see me and he said, I wanted to apply for a job that's coming up because we wanted to teach at a London College of Fashion. Tried to leave then, he wouldn't let me leave. And it was a really good package. He wouldn't let me leave. And he said, look, if you can buy some shares in the business, you can, then it's available to you. And so I worked for 50% of my salary. I went right back to half salary. And the other half, I bought some shares in the company. But I then, I took a part-time job at London College of Fashion. And I was teaching there from 1976 to 1988. I'm telling you this background. This all relates to the story you asked me, the question you asked me. Because I continued teaching Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I'm developing a career teaching and developing a parallel career on Savile Row and making suits for friends on weekends and so on. I was building a, a customer base. So come five years, Maurice said, I wanted five years after 1982, 1988. Now I'm 14 years at Maurice said, I said to Mr. Sedwell, I want to leave. I want to start my own business. He still wouldn't let me leave. He says, if you can buy the business, we'll sell you 90% of the business and we'll keep 10. But if you can raise the money, but I'd been saving and saving and saving and saving. And I bought Maurice Sedwell Limited in August, 1988. I'm gonna go a little bit back because the answer to my question is that you know that you made it is when you wanted to leave and they didn't want you to go. (laughs) Yeah, you found that answer for me. Yeah, 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 you're right. You found that answer for me. So I'm giving you plenty of when I made it. When I felt I really made it, Stephen, when I felt I really made it, it was when I had 90% of Maurice Sedwell Limited 
I moved from number nine Saburo to where I'm sitting here now, number 19 Saburo, from 500 square feet of space to 3,000 square feet of space, having tailored suits for customers at that time in, in about 30 countries. And I locked the door on the first evening. Did you pull out a cigar and some cognac? I and said the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> I said the Lord's Prayer aloud. But I still think that you made it when the first person that you were working for and somebody come in and say, well, they want you to work here. No, uh, don't leave. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That means that they, at that particular point in time, recognize your importance to their business. <clears throat> Indeed. Well, Mr. Sedwell recognized that, but I didn't, I needed the money. I wanted the money. I was mm -hmm. moving for the money mm -hmm. because I wanted to buy my own home. I wanted to buy my own home. I actually bought my own home in 1975. So that's two and three is five. So I was 23 years old when I bought my own house. Mind you, at that time, it would cost a lot of money. It was very expensive. It cost me 9,000 pounds. Oh, to buy a, <laughs> a home for 9,000 pounds today would be wonderful, wouldn't it? <laughs> you can't even buy a garage for 9,000 pounds a month sometimes, some places. Tell me about Maurice. How was he in terms of his interrelationship with you? Maurice Edward was a very interesting man. He had been... Uh, in the radar room in the, in the Navy during the war. He had traveled the world. He had been open to other peoples. He had seen other type of peoples. He had docked in different type parts of the world. So he'd been widely traveled. He'd been open-minded. Whereas all these other shops and cyber, all these tailoring houses, what is all upper class, upper class, uh, that uh, weren't traveled at all. Maurice said was a guy, he had a great sense of humor. He would invite me out to lunch. I was known as the West Indian because he used to get criticism from his colleagues about having a West Indian. I was known as the West Indian and he would sing my praises to these guys. And then he actually, I tell you what, how I got my first house. He's the one who bought a newspaper with homes advertised. And, and then I looked at these things and I bought a house not far from where he lived. He lived in the posh part, but I, he, lived in, he lived in a 60,000 pound house and I lived in a 9,000 pound house, but it's like a 6 million and a, and a, and a 900,000 pound house. It was like a completely different world. It was a different world. Private gate to drive in and stuff like that. Gated houses. So you, you had to go through a century to get into that area it was like those houses are worth millions now and uh, so he encouraged me to get my own house and i went to the local council and got a loan there at a, at a low rate of interest for for poor people loan uh, yeah and i sold that house for fifteen thousand. i made a nice little profit and i bought another house i got a mortgage i bought another one for twenty three thousand. yeah so it's, that's the journey of me acquiring property now, after you acquired 90% of the business from being there for 14 years, I'm sure you had some ideas of if you ran this place, this is what I would do. And what are some of the changes that you made? I'll tell you, Stephen, it's, it's interesting you should ask that question because I had always, one of the reasons why Mr. Sedwell on reflection gave me that opportunity it's because i had always been constructively critical of what we were doing i would be very critical of the standard of craftsmanship to cut and the fit and everything i would say why don't we do this why don't we do that whatever it is he used to call me the doctor because anything that went wrong and i used to fix it i used to put it right and i changed everything i first thing i did I literally cleared out the entire 500 square feet of space and to four walls and I redecorated and I had a separate front showroom, separated tailor's back room, a little office that fitted the size of a desk 
and all that it fitted was a desk and a chair and I had a fitting room. And I accommodated the customers in a really nice fitting room. There was no more than like about four feet wide by about five feet long, but they had a fitting room now, which they didn't have before. And I changed the threads that we use instead of using cotton. Cotton is very good. We still use cotton, but I, but I changed that to pure silk to finish, do all the hand finish. I changed the buttons from plastic buttons to natural horn buttons, stag horn buttons. I changed the quality of cloths that we used, the interlining, the body lining. I became very pedantic about our standards. I did, I reduced the amount of machine work that the company did and I increased the amount of handwork that we did. From there was like uh, a 50-50 or maybe less than 50 in maybe 30%, 25, 30% handwork and the rest was machine. I swung it around completely, 90% handwork until today. I, because I came to London, I came to Savile Row because of the reputation of handcraft tailoring. And when I came here, I found Maurice Settle wasn't doing what I dreamt was being done. Not only Maurice Settle, several other tailors. And so I decided that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to stand out. If, if you think of Savile Row, every building is a tailor. There are 40 addresses in Savile Row. It's only a short street. Every building is a tailor. And around the corner on Clifford Street, they're tailors. The other street, Conduit Street, they're tailors. Every other side street, they're tailors. Everywhere. Ready to wear didn't have a look in at that time. It was all tailors. And so how do you, in, if you're in the same marketplace, stand out? How can you be different? How can you be desirable? And I made a conscious de decision to take the gentleman's suit and redesign it into our signature style, which is what I do today. I didn't have the confidence to encourage customers to do it, but gradually over the years, I changed it. Now, less than 1% of the suits we make is a standard suit. We make our own signature styles. Did you find that when you took over the com company for a while, was there a dip in terms of the people who frequent the shop for services that they just decided not to be there anymore? The drop in business was about 80, 90%. I had no business because Maurice Settle was not there. Even though I was doing all of the work while he was there and his managing director was there and all the tailors were there. I fired all the tailors, by the way. I didn't get any. What I did is I had the address book and I wrote to all of the customers, giving them a reference of another customer they can write to, to verify my standards. I didn't ask permission. And I was basically trying to be creative because I know they ain't going to write to anybody else. Also, when I was with Maurice said the PPS, the Permanent Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister was a guy called Mark Lennox Boyd. Mark Lennox Boyd was a very political family, professional politicians, and uh, now he's Lord Boyd. Now, Mark Lennox Boyd had come in there and Maurice Settle had made him two suits. I had nothing to do with the suits. And I was the only person in the shop. And I said to him, Mr. Lennox Boyd, I think there's a slight pull on the shoulder of your suit, a uh, jacket. I think I can fix it. And he said, all my suits are like that. And I said, let me have them. I, could, I can fix them. And so he sent the first two that we made him. I fixed them. And then he sent a bunch of other suits for me to fix. I fixed them all. And he had them collected. Now, this is a guy who had been to Maurice Sedwell twice before and saw me. He just turned up and went away because the boss wasn't there. No one was there. I was there on my own. And he went away. Twice that happened. So on this third occasion, when he turned up, because the PPS the Prime Minister don't make appointments, he just turns up. And when I fixed all his suit, he phoned up Maurice Sedwell and he asked what my name was. This is after fixing all his suit. He didn't even know my name. Then he said to Maurice Sedwell, when next I come back to your establishment, I want Andrew to fit my suits. And that was an important turning point because when I bought the company, I wrote to Marks and Lennox Boyd 
and I said to him, I would like to have introductions. He introduced me to 24 members of parliament and I had six cabinet ministers, the closest people to the prime minister coming to me to have their suits made. That's a great that story. Is... That's a great story. Yeah. <clears throat> kudos, kudos. As you move forward, you own Maurice Sidwell and knowing that you became quite successful along the way, you turn to something else because in your background is always about giving back, right? The Royal Academy. Yes, yeah. let's talk, talk about that. The Savile Row Tailoring Academy. Now, there's, there's a great risk here, Stephen. You ask me a question, I tell you a whole long damn story. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> because there's never a short answer to how you get this journey that of discovery that I talked about, that vision. I had a vision that the tailoring establishments of Savile Row, they're so damn selfish. They never take on trainees. They never take on apprentices. If they took you on, they teach you to make trousers and you make trousers until you retire. If it's jackets, you make jackets until you retire. If it's to make pockets, all you do ever do in your life is make pockets. To become a presser, you just press the suits. That's all you ever did. They didn't multi-skill train you. And I was very much into multi-skilling and, and training because I've been teaching at London College of Fashion. And it was while being a student, I was teaching. So I developed the skill to impart knowledge and experience. And so teaching become a part of my DNA. And I found myself with being president of the Master Tailors Association because I'm the only guy who would be proactive in just about anything in this association. So they elected me as president. But I was just president and they would never action anything that I'm introducing. And so I got, after seven years of being president, I got fed up with them because every year I would say, look, I want to have, I brought training on the agenda and my annual speech. I would talk about training, marketing, promoting, advertising. They were never interested. They weren't prepared to change with the times. They weren't prepared to change with any kind of developments. They thought it was going to last forever. And I said, look, if you're not going to adopt training, they had a secret vote not to support me. 39 members, secret vote not to support me. I resigned as president and I started the Savile Row Academy in 2007 with six students on a three-year degree. I didn't reinvent the wheel, the same degree I did. I taught that degree, not giving them a degree, but teaching them ready to work training so that after three years, you can get jobs. But what I was also doing at uh, that three years, they were being interviewed without their knowing they were being interviewed because I was looking for people whom I could train and employ. They paid for their training. So if they wanted to go out somewhere else, then they could have gone. And I employ four out of the six that I, after three years, I employed four out of six people. And that's how I started to, to build and build. So this, this building was recent. And now I've trained, we, I actually literally yesterday checked how many we trained in at the Cyber Row Academy. It's 285 students been through the Cyber Row Academy already from 15 countries. So sharing knowledge and experience. Then I've been abroad teaching. I've been back to my homeland teaching tailoring, which is a, a degree three, two year degree that I just finished uh, teaching. So I come and go. And now my hope is to expand the knowledge to the United States. And how are you going about that? Again, there's another story. I've made suits now for customers in 60 countries. 30% of the customers I have from abroad come from the United States. 30%. So there's a huge demand. And every other tailor on Cyber Row have at least that percentage or even more of American customers that actually come to Cyber Road to have their suits made. So there is a huge market. I have the Cyber Road Academy here in London and I get a huge amount of applications from the United States. And I thought, and they have problems in getting visas to come because it's a small school. Uh, we haven't, we've got a license to teach, design and deliver the courses. 
but not license for visas because the idea of the license is to provide uh, ready to work training for the industry and to employ local people. And so the applications that we get from the US, we can't fulfill those. They can come on a holiday for six months, but it's a longer course. And if they come and they do six months, then that's okay. So I felt I wanted to reach out to the country that's been so generous to me over the years. And I started traveling out to the United States in 1991. And so more than 30 years now I've been coming out. Well, 30, oh, actually February this year was 30 years. And so the country has been very good to me. I wanna be able to give back same way as I went to Trinidad and I spent two years giving back and training 35 students there into becoming master tailors over two years. I felt, you know what? The United States is the next stop. That's where I want to go. That's where I want to share the knowledge and experience. And I get a lot of applications from the US. And so to develop the, the Savile Row Academy, S-R-A-U-S-A, -A, that's the plan. My, my hope is if not by the latter part of next year, certainly the early part of 2023, to be firmly established teaching. I tell you what, as I said earlier on, I didn't reinvent the wheel when I started the Savile Row Academy. I'm not gonna reinvent the wheel. I'm gonna teach the, the skills that I have learned and the skills that I have developed over the years. And my skills now have completely changed from when I first came out of the London College of Fashion. I've developed my own system of pattern drafting, cutting, fitting, problems, diagnosis, remedy. I have designed the suit, my own suits, designed fabrics, and I am now wanting to come out of the States to teach art and design, bespoke tailorings, business studies, entrepreneurial you know, studies, and what is very important to what I want to do in the United States, which I have not done here in the UK, is I want to run a train the trainers program. So as part of the three-year degree that I want to teach out there, is that a part of it, it will be a train to trainers program. So we hopefully will start with 15 students in the first year, take them into the second year. We're not gonna have a selection process like we had at London College of Fashion. Instead of selecting 10 and then on to eight, I wanna put all 15 into the second year and then all 15 into the third year and just keep taking 15 every year. And in the final year, after the, they finish their degree, I wanna select those and they're going through a silent interview of those whom I become good teachers and put them through a program of what I would call trainer trainers. So they will become trainers and, and so there'll be continuity. So the SRA USA, Cyber Row Academy USA is gonna be the center of learning in preferably in Washington DC because I like the city. It's gonna be the center of learning for all of North America. And a lot of the countries where they can't get visas to come into to the UK to train, we're going to be training them in the United States. Do you have a way that people who might want to be involved in donations or, or something like that in terms of helping to make this dream of yours come true? Do you have an address and an email for them to do? I'll put it at the end of the broadcast, but I, I want you to tell them where they need to go to. That's a, I hadn't thought about that question, but thank you very much for asking that question. Because what I've done is I've registered a 5013C uh, not-for-profit in Washington, D.C. What is it called? It's called the Cyber Row Academy. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very creative, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, it's I've registered a Cyber Row Academy, 5013C, and we're looking for donations to make this happen. And we're going to my primary purpose, I'll say this to you, even though we open to everyone, I get very emotional about, and I'm getting choked up now. Sorry. It's called Progress Despite Obstacles. I get very emotional about teaching my own people. So there's going to be an emphasis on trying to make sure that you bring aboard people that have been uh, marginalized along the way. And it's something that's here in the United States, it's needed. Sometimes 
people have a tendency to think that the United States is all everything. It's a great country. It has lots of problems. I, I always remember one of the greatest blues singer in American history, in, in history, has been Muddy Waters. And Muddy Waters was a big star for Chess Records. But people don't realize Chuck Berry came to come to prominence because Muddy Waters did the same thing that you're doing, is that it, he wanted to help the next generation move forward. And he brought forth in terms of Muddy, Chuck Berry, although Chuck Berry had the talent and everything else, but it was his introduction to the head of Chess Records that made Chuck Berry what Chuck Berry was. <clears throat> And we have a lot of different examples of that. And you go down as one of the major ones in history in terms of, of that happening in this and in, in along this time. And I do want all the people out there that I know to contribute. I can't say it any better than that is to contribute because it's a good cause. And you have shown your ability to not only do the work, but also train the people. I think it's important. <clears throat> I think it's important that I'm um, sharing knowledge, even though a lot of what I do is self-taught to development in my career and my skills. We at somewhere someone's taught us something. And it is our responsibility to share, to multiply, to go out there and reach those people who don't get it. There's, there's a saying here in the United States, it might be the same in England, is that we stand on the shoulders of others, of the ones who came before us. That's how we get. A lot of people think that I was so good that this happened. No, somebody gave you, somebody reached out and helped you and you stand on their shoulders, no matter who they might be. And in this case, I'm listening to you and I'm thankful for your father because he was the one that you were able to stand on the shoulders. He might have caned you a little bit, as you said, <laughs> but he was doing it because he wanted the best out of you, I would imagine. And he showed his love by being there for you when you needed to and being supportive of you. Mm. <clears throat> you asked how to reach me. Yes. It, it's andrew at sabaroacademy.co.uk. And, and, Say it and, one more time. Say it one more time. Andrew at Savile Row Academy dot co dot uk. Always remember, Savile is one L. As you guys say, Savile. It's one L on Savile. So that's S A V I L E. Row as in row, the sort of things you never have in your life. R O W. So S A V I L E R O W Academy dot co dot uk. Andrew at cyberrocademy.co.uk. I thank you so much for being on the show. That's the show about stuff, the Stephen Davis show. Tune in next week for another wonderful episode. Bye. Bye. Thank you, thank you for tuning in this week. Hope you enjoyed this show about stuff. See you next time. Oh, my name is Jewel. You don't need to know who I am, but you should know why I'm here. My grandpa, Stephen, is an author of a new exciting play called When the Break Happened in Orangeburg County. It's about our ancestors from when the break happened in 1865 until now. Many of my relatives are featured in the play from my great, great, great grandpa Stephen to my great grandpa Stephen to my grandpa Stephen. Guess what my uncle and cousin's name are? Stephen, go to www.thebreakinorangeburg.com to learn more. An online store has been created to honor those relatives and other families with products featuring the Break logo. Go to www.thebreakstore.com to purchase items today and help to produce this play. Please!